Great. Um, hello, everyone. <laughs> good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. <laughs> Thanks for joining today's CNCF live webinar towards hybrid cloud, uh, towards hybrid cloud serverless transparency with the lit lith ops framework um i'm christy tan and i'll be moderating today's webinar we would like to welcome our presenter gil vernick um, he's a cloud and data expert with ibm a few housekeeping items before we get started during the webinar you are not able to talk as an attendee there is a q a box in the platform that you'll be able to submit your questions through there you can also submit them through the chat please drop your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end this is an official webinar of CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that Code of Conduct. Basically, please be respectful of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and the slides for this webinar will be posted later today to the CNCF online programs page at community.cncf.io under online programs. With that, I'll hand it over to Gil to kick off today's presentation. Take it away. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so my name is Gil Vernick. I'm working at IBM Research. I active in open source, contribute code, and my recent focus is hybrid cloud, all kind of big data execution engines and serverless computing. Uh, but, uh, part of this uh, work that I present today, we develop as part of the Cloud Button EU project. It's a very interesting project with many participants, and you can see here uh, in the picture and all the outcome of the project and all the documentation, some things we developed there are open and you can welcome to see what uh, we developed there and what technologies we do there. Uh, and, and obviously what I, whatever I present today is an open source and everything, all the videos are available and also the code you can just try it after the talk or any time you want. A special thanks to Giuseppe uh, Sampe and Pedro from the uh, University URV who are very contributing to the project and uh, from the open source aspects of the project. Uh, so the title, as you know, it has a lot of uh, uh, fancy words, right? We have a hybrid cloud and we have a serverless transparency and then this mysterious NITOPS framework. And, but those, but this is what I will cover today, and uh, hopefully it will not be. You, you, you will understand what is it about, and what we, what is the problem, and what is the solution we propose, and all those, uh, uh, all this title will be, will be more clear at the end. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I know that many obviously understand what is serverless platform, but a uh, serverless uh, paradigm but uh, sometimes the subject is not well defined, so just to be on the same page. So it obviously doesn't mean that there are no servers, right? There are some servers, but uh, me, uh, we as a users, we don't need to worry about them because with the serverless paradigm, we just deploy, we deliver our code, our software to that serverless platform, to the serverless provider. And uh, then that backend engine you will know, take care of all of the provisioning and execution of our code. And that basically means we just don't need to think about servers anymore. And so this name serverless appear. And uh, now, if you see today, and it's from the web page of CNCF, so there are a lot of serverless platforms today, and some of them hosted, some of them based on the open source. Uh, uh, so it's very nice. I mean, you have a lot of options to experiment and to use serverless uh, computing today. Uh, both install it on-prem, uh, use open source, so go to kind of uh, cloud providers who provide this to you. And uh, I assume this just will be growing even more. Uh, now, so serverless user experience is the key, right? Because uh, the more we focus on the business logic as users, and so unless how to deploy, how to execute, how to take care of the execution, but the more we focus on the business logic, uh, so better is our serverless experience. And users have different options, how they can deliver their software packages to the serverless backends for the executions. So they might just provide their code uh, via all kinds of APIs. And they may upload some zip files with their code and dependencies. They may also wrap their code into Docker images and upload it uh, to the serverless provider and execute it there in the Docker images. 
So different options uh, available. Uh, but uh, but here's what I want to start with. So there are some challenges here. I mean, uh, and some things are uh, less obvious and may require a bit more uh, uh, time to, to make them work. Uh, first of all, uh, so you have a Docker image and you, and you want to, you have your code, you have your software, you have dependencies. Uh, so obviously you take dependencies, packages and software and you may pack them into Docker image. Uh, but then you also have your code. Now, sometimes you don't want to use to pack your code into the Docker image because it might be some sensitive information. It may be some uh, non-open source code. It may be some uh, other uh, details that you don't want to expose. And then the question came, uh, okay, so how you take this Docker image with the dependencies that your code require, but you inject your code on the maybe at runtime, or maybe you don't want to expose it. So there are different solutions, of course, available. But if you want to take this Docker image and move it across different cloud providers and maybe run it in the, your Kubernetes, and then you want to maybe run on some uh, public uh, cloud provider that also provides you Kubernetes API, then it's not really clear where you keep this Docker image with your codes. Uh, you may use some private Docker repository, maybe. So there are different options here. And it's not well defined. I mean, you still, as a user, you need to know how to make this Docker image with your code uh, uh, move against different cloud providers if you want it and where is your code. Uh, so this is one of the challenges that you just need to address. Now, there is also a gap between business logic and the boilerplate code. Um, so you as a user, so assume you just you want to run some machine learning algorithms on the colors from images. So you write a single function and, uh, that, and you test it that it works. If this function just take a single image and you extract uh, colors from that image. Now you want to run these functions on millions of images and some located in different storage places, maybe some in cloud object storage, maybe some in your local object storage, maybe some in Ceph. Now I want to extract all the colors and you want to inject them into machine learning framework for further processing. Uh, but here comes the challenge. I mean, here are a couple of challenges. First of all, uh, uh, so where you run your code? I mean, you don't want to download those images and run it over your Kubernetes. Maybe you want to deploy your code and run it as close as possible to the data. So maybe you want to keep it on object storage in some public cloud. Uh, so where you run your code, local, cloud, hybrid, uh, how you collect results, and again, how you move as less data as possible. And then you also need to write a lot of boilerplate code. And by boilerplate code, I mean additional code that not need, not really needed by your business logic, because all what you focus now is to extract colors and run machine learning. But here you need to write much more code, how to access object storage, how to access storage, how to list, how to uh, download, say, how to read those objects those data objects. So there are a lot of additional code that you need to do and there's some gap here, I mean, so, so that you need to, to fill between your business logic and how to make it happen. And uh, and now these millions of images, it's also a lot of complexity, right? How you partition those millions of images, how you, how you list them, how much memory you need to process them. Maybe one image needs more memory, another image needs less memory. Uh, where you deploy your code, where you run it. So there are a lot of things they need to address uh, when you want to scale your code at massive scale. Um, and this is another challenge uh, that uh, also need to address. Now, another challenge is the APIs. I mean, so if you see today, you have a, a patch open whisk API, then you have Kubernetes API, and then you have Knative API. So already I mentioned three, but then you also have different APIs and you need to have different CLI tools. You need to learn, you need to know uh, the semantics of the serverless backend, how you want, uh, how to use it. And then it's also cloud vendor has uh, its own API if you want to go to public cloud. So there are a lot of different APIs and you as a user that you just wrote your code and now you want to run it against uh, API that expose the uh, OpenVisc, Apache OpenVisc API, or maybe another, uh, to run it over Kubernetes, you need to implement uh, many things and you need to know those APIs. 
So it adds another challenge that you basically need to be familiar with many APIs and perhaps adapt your code. Uh, now another challenge is the containerization and containerized model. So it's not just to take your code, put it code and dependencies, put it into Docker image and deploy it say, over, I don't know, OpenShift or Kubernetes. Uh, it actually, you also need to, to take care of it, how you, how to minimize impact on your application because you don't want to rewrite it. Maybe you already have an application and now you want to scale some code or parts from it and you don't want to rewrite everything from scratch. So it, it brings a challenge how you make your application to be in container, to, to be executed in container and then how you scale this code, how you decide right parallelism, how many containers you need, how you process data sets, how you partition input data sets, how you generate outputs, how you maybe you need some cache. So uh, all those aspects you need to address uh, when you want to take your application and see and run it over uh, I don't know, Kubernetes at massive scale. And, oh, and again, uh, the key point here that you don't want to rewrite your application because maybe you already have an application and you want to just uh, scale it. You don't want to make something else out of it. Um, and so th those are challenges. And from, from here, I, I will take you to the, to the solutions, right? And what we, how, how we address those challenges. And I will show you demos and examples, of course. Uh, so the, so the, the framework that we speak about, uh, LitOps framework, it's an open source framework, Apache uh, license, and uh, it's a Python framework that's designed to scale code applications at massive scale against uh, any serverless backend, any serverless platform. You can run on hybrid, hybrid cloud, uh, private, public, your private Kubernetes, uh, public uh, cloud provider. And uh, you see here those backends that we have. Uh, uh, some of them are uh, from a public cloud providers, uh, IBM Cloud, Amazon, Azure, Google Cloud, Alibaba Cloud. We have Red Hat and Kubernetes. And, uh, and this is growing, please, to be adding more. And uh, this many lead by us from IBM and also University uh, from Tarragona, your university. And the goal of this project is to provide serverless for more use cases and also the easy move to serverless. So if you take your application and you easy move to those all kinds of serverless backends and you don't need, don't really need to learn new APIs or new techniques. Um, so the general idea, and we will see demo in a minute. So general idea here, you, you, you have your uh, function and you have some input data sets maybe. Now you take the function, you take import litops and you, you use litops function executor. Then you tell it, please run my function against this input data. And from that moment, litops deploy uh, the function, serialize it, it deployed to the serverless backend, execute it there. Uh, it also know how to partition data sets if needed, and then you just get your results. So this is user experience on the left and uh, all that complexity, how you move to the cloud, how you run it, is actually done by Litos. Uh, now, it's designed to scale Python applications, and uh, as I said, but uh, Python is not limited to Python. So you basically can run any native uh, code as well. And we demonstrated all kinds of use cases, with Gromax, Protomol, Dlib, GDAL, FFmpeg, and so on. Because everything that you can uh, run from Python, you can just scale it in the same way. Uh, uh, so LitOps Expose API, which is one of the multi-processing API of Python, another is Futures API of Python. And this is what users see, right? You just, you have your function and you use function executor of LitOps, and then you say, oh, please, I want to run my function, hello, with the input uh, parameter world, and you get your results. And from that moment, LitOps take this function, take the input data, which is one word here, uh, deploy everything against the serverless backends that we want to use, which is configured in the configuration of LitOps, and you run it, it LitOps run it there and get, give your results back. And you have also multi-processing API of Python, which, uh, uh, which is also popular in Python. Uh, so this is a moment to show you a, a demo. I recorded it before, and, and I will, there will be four demos in my presentation. This is one of them, the first one. I will show it in VLC because uh, 
it shows it's a little bit better. Uh, so I have my notebook on my laptop and I want to run a series of uh, calculations, Monte Carlo calculations to calculate number pi. Uh, so it's a regular notebook, uh, just run my dependencies and this is my business logic code that he wrote. Uh, just let me stop it a second. And so I want to call, I, I use uh, known techniques how to calculate number pi. This is the code I have. And I want to do one uh, uh, linear calculations. And now I want to take my code and I want to run it over my uh, laptop, let's say, okay? Uh, so if I run it over localhost, I tell, I use Litops and I use localhost executor. So it now run it here over 100 threads in my machine. And uh, it will take time. So also here you see the, how easy I can take the code and scale it on my machine. In this example, my machine is my laptop, but I can also use run it over some VM, which has much more resources. But here it will obviously will be slow right, because I run 100 threads and uh, I, uh, so it takes time. It wasn't running on my laptop. I will make it a little bit faster for you. You will see it will be completed at some point. Um, good. It's slow. Now I want to take the same code, exactly the same code, I'm using exactly the same notebook, and I want to deploy it against a serverless platform that exposes Apache OpenVisc API. Now I can either have it uh, somewhere installed in my organization or, uh, or I can use, I, in this example, I'm using IBM Cloud Functions that expose Apache OpenVisc API. Uh, so it's the same API and I want to run this code and deploy it there. So the only change in it to my code is to write here back into IBM Cloud Functions. Now there is a hidden configuration file that you don't see here that contains uh, API keys uh, to access my account. But that's it. But from the code point of view, there's no only change, right? IBM Cloud Functions. And I want to run it against uh, that backend. Now, again, I, as I said, I use function executor of LitOps and I deploy my code. And from that moment, this code is serialized and deployed against 100 parallel invocations in IBM Cloud Functions, only 100 tasks that will start running right now. And uh, and they, uh, they progress, I mean, they, they will be finished uh, faster. And, uh, and that's it. Now I get my results uh, back on my laptop from the execution in the cloud functions. And uh, now I have the number pi. Now I want to take the same code and I want to run it against Kubernetes API. Again, very have Kubernetes API, either in my organization, in this example, I. I use IBM code engine that exposed Kubernetes API with the job descriptors and uh, all that stuff. And again, the only change I had to do is to change backend to code engine. And uh, then my code executed there and, uh, and that's how it works. Uh, so this is the first video and uh, again, it will run and uh, set up all the, whatever it needed there and I will get my results back. Um, so, um, so this is how LitOps work, right? Now let's get back to my presentation and this is the link to the video on in YouTube that you can see it later. So this is the user experience as you show, as, as I showed you before. A user doesn't see anything else and there are no hidden tricks. All this, the LitOps framework does uh, in the backend uh, by itself in the code we developed in the LitOps and user doesn't see all this complexity, how to take his code and deploy it against OpenVisc API and then deploy it against Kubernetes API and maybe run it local. And those are backends and uh, storage we support. So you see we have a long list of uh, platforms, both hosted, both open source. And uh, as I said, it's the, this list is growing. And now more on LitOps, uh, so it's a truly serverless framework. It's scaled from zero to many. I, I don't need to keep any cluster in my cloud. I don't need to keep anything ready in the Kubernetes, in OpenShift. I just I just take my LitOps, I deploy the job, and then it will start to deploy it. So there is absolutely nothing that should wait for me in those uh, backends. And it's a lightweight, and uh, as you saw, it can deploy uh, basically with a single Litops API, can use any compute backend. 
it's data driven. The framework is data driven by by sense that it has uh, many uh, components from the big data processing uh, tools, uh, algorithms uh, mainly that know how to partition large data sets and how to process large data sets, how to chunk them, how to chunk CSV files without breaking, I don't know, in the middle of the line, how to chunk other files and how to process uh, data from object storage. And uh, this is very important because this enable you to process actually big data and not just, because in, in the example of Monte Carlo, you saw it more compute. I mean, there was no data in object storage, but we will see later how we can use Litops also to process massive data sets in object storage. Uh, so as I said, this is the data driven flows with Litops. So Litops, uh, it's uh, when you deploy your Docker image, Litops framework is deployed as well, and in that uh, together with that container, and uh, and Litops know this Litops runtime that will be deployed in the serverless backends together with the, with the user code. It actually this is what gives the benefit to hide all the complexity from the user. So Litops decide the right scale, how to handle accesses to datasets, how to partition them. You maybe use cache. They coordinate parallel invocations, chunk them, group them, and so on, write results back to some object storage maybe of the invocations or give them back to user. And all this completely transparent to the user because he just gets it from the meetups. Um, and so what it's good for uh, this, uh, this framework, right? It's obviously we don't want to deploy Hello World. We want to do some more interesting stuff with it. Uh, so it's good for all kinds of data preprocessing. And data preprocessing is an important when you use machine learning, deep learning, all kinds of AI frameworks, because the raw data sets usually need to be preprocessed in some way. And preprocessing is very important. If you manage to preprocess them efficiently, cost effective, and fast, then you they feed the results from the preprocessing to your machine learning frameworks, and then all this ecosystem may behave very good. Uh, you can use it obviously for batch processing on kind of Monte Carlo simulations and compute driven workloads. And basically we also support MapReduce, but the MapReduce is limited because we don't yet support shuffle internally in meetups. And so the MapReduce is you have many maps and one reduce. It's not, it's still good because it's cover all kind of use cases and um, and this is where we stopped. We didn't want to make it a truly MapReduce framework because we didn't see any benefit for this. Um, and it's good for those embarrassingly parallel workloads. It's basically a problem that you can take and you can chunk it in different tasks. Each task will execute some uh, its parts of the execution and um, and then uh, th those kind of workloads is good with Litops. Uh, we, we can also exchange information between tasks, but uh, you, you don't see it here and can show it later. Uh, so let's see some demos in use cases. Uh, we are about uh, 25 minutes after the talk and I think it's good to start here. Uh, so let's see data processing, okay? That's what I said before, but now I will show you also some uh, video and demo and uh, what exactly we are doing. So as I said, majority of machine learning, deep learning frameworks need data pre-processed before you can do something with them. Uh, if you want to run all kind of deep learning over, uh, Im over images, you, some, in many cases you need to extract, for example, colors, right? Just one example. So if you extract colors from the image, the image might be megabytes in colors. It's just an array that it consume kilobytes. Uh, so you extract them and see, it's very nice if you have uh, one, 10 images, 100 images, you can just run it uh, sequentially and you know, maybe download them to your laptop and run it. But if you have millions of images and you want to extract colors, this became a, a challenge, how you do it. And where you keep those colors, then how you deploy them back to your machine learning framework. So there are all kinds of aspects here. Face alignment is another example. It's not only about, it's not related face recognition, but you know, sometimes you need to align faces in images and remove the noise. So you see your image, you, it's, it's a picture of a face and then you have some noise in the background. You apply face alignment with images, you get this image. 
Uh, again, if you use it uh, one image, then it's good. But if you have thousands, ten thousands of images, hundred thousands of images, then it's again the same challenge. Now, phase alignment in particular, we, we did some experiments with it. Uh, so this is your business logic on the left, and now you want you have like uh, we used one thousand images in object storage. Uh, and now this is the boilerplate code that you need to run to list those images and chunk them and apply your code on those images and get results and store them back maybe. Uh, so it's about 100 lines of boilerplate code that you don't really need. Now, if you have, and you also need to be familiar with the object storage API because if it's S3 API, then you need to write here something that works with S3 API. It's uh, no, no, OpenStack Swift, you need to use uh, some other tool to access OpenStack Swift. Uh, and so you need to know this and you need to know how to write your code. And if it's more than 1,000 images, you need to chunk them because a single response will not return you all those images. So that's complicated. If you take meetups, you just take the same business logic and deploy it with three lines of boilerplate code because you just tell meetups, oh, this is my code and this is the data sets in object storage, then just write it then just uh, run it. And then in experiments we did, uh, it was like 35 seconds compared to 36 minutes when you run it uh, over your laptop, I don't know, with 1,000 images. But if it's much more than that, then it's obviously will be, you, you can't run it over your laptop anymore. And so the complexity will be. Um, and the demo here I want to show you is exactly this color identification. Now, I the, the good part in this demo, this is what I like. So. I didn't wrote the business logic code. Uh, I found very nice blog by Karan Banot who just wrote color identification in images and he demonstrated very nice uh, blog how you can take uh, image extract colors and then how you can and then how you can retrieve all kinds of uh, images based on the colors that you have inside. Uh, but now I show you how I can take this existing code without modified and executed at massive scale against the serverless platform. And uh, in this example, I demonstrate you when Nidetops use a backend based on the Kubernetes API. And uh, the example here, we have images storage in object storage. And now user want to retrieve all the images that contain specific color. Like give me please all the images from object storage that contains color blue. And uh, so this is the example. Original blog just showed you how you can do it, but uh, without skill. And again, this is the video and I'm uh, going back to my VLC and I'm going to show you um, the video of a color extraction. Uh, so this is the code that they said from the blog and uh, it's a regular Python. And again, it's a Python notebook. And you see here, we ha I have some local image on my laptop uh, and I see that I can read it, I can display it. Now you write my business logic code, color identification to see if the color, particular color in that image. And now I uh, see that I can first of all extract colors from the image. And uh, again, image on my laptop and I see, oh, I managed to extract colors from that image that you just saw before. Now I want to, uh, to test that my code can extract color from a single image and return. So this example, I want to see if uh, this image uh, has color uh, green, I think, but you don't see it here. Uh, so I tested my code on a single image. Yeah, blue, sorry. So this image test, if, the, if this image contains color blue, if yes, it returns me true, otherwise not. And I tested it on my laptop and it works very fine. Now I have object storage in, uh, and here I use uh, in my cloud and this is my bucket and this is images they have there. Uh, as I said before, I'm using K Kubernetes API, but uh, I don't have it on my laptop. I'm using uh, IBM Code Engine, IBM Cloud Code Engine that exposes this API. And I want to tell, I want to give me all the images from this uh, location that has colors green. And, uh, and, and take the code that we had before in the notebook. Ugh. Let me get here. Yeah. 
And now from that moment, uh, LitOps uh, applied a uh, big data practitioner that access these data sets in the object storage. It expects what is the images there, what are the sizes, and it deploy your code against those images and you get your results back. So in this example, I used 50 images. And you see that it took seconds to deploy the code and get all the images back. Let me stop here for a second. And uh, and uh, and this is the power of, of LitOps. I mean, it, it take your code, it deploy it. You don't need to do anything with object storage API. You, you don't even aware of it. In this example, we used it was 50 invocations because we have 50 images. If there are more images, we have more images, and if there are millions of images, need to so know how to chunk them so you will not have millions of invocations. And now I want to rerun my codes again, and this time I want to give me all the images that now have a blue color. See, it completed in 27 seconds, 27 seconds this execution against the clouds from your laptop to the cloud. And now I want to extract all the images that has blue color and again, it's exactly the same. I just change argument here, and the code is deployed, executed, and I get my uh, results uh, back. And again, I got all the images that has blue color. Now, obviously, we can take this example and uh, make it uh, more uh, like the colors that we get. We can inject them into a you know, kind of machine learning framework, as I said before. So there are a lot of freedom you can have here. And this is, as I said, this is exactly what happens behind the scenes. So it inspects this input data set in object storage. It generates DAG, direct cyclic graph of execution. In this example, it's map a single task to process a single image. It serializes user codes, serializes execution DAG, and all kinds of other metadata, uploads them all to the object storage. In this example, we can use other storage, of course, that an antibiotic storage. Then it helps generate config map, job definition, in code engine. And based on the provided Docker image, if there is any, if not, it uses it default. It deployed these workloads against the serverless backend. And, uh, and it helps map a single task to a single point in this uh, graph of execution. So each task, when it will start, it's uh, running in the serverless. It will know exactly what kind of data it needs to process, uh, where it needs to report the results and what it needs to do. And once task completed, they just write their statuses back and uh, results back to the object storage and uh, in this example. And then the uh, DTOPS just reads all the results uh, back from the shared storage, from the object storage, and you get, you get them back. Now, the user experience here is the key. Uh, I mean, uh, so with LitOps, you have user experience on the right. Uh, you don't see anything. With the, without LitOps, you would have a very interesting user experience. You may need to write all kinds of deployment definitions, job descriptions, user application, how to deploy, how to pack it, how to run it, how to scale it, how to list objects. And then uh, you work very hard, and then one day you want to run it against uh, Apache Open with API, and and then you start to uh, work again hard because you need to run that API, and uh, uh, but the little you don't see. This is an interesting, another interesting example that I want to show you is spatial metabolomics. It's a real example. It's a different project that you work with them. It's also open source project that they use Litops. Uh, so the idea here is that, uh, and I'm not expert in these fields, but it's very exciting. Uh, so those guys know how to take all kinds of, understand all kinds of anomalies in cells. And when they do it, they can figure out if the somatical image uh, contains some anomalies like cancer or some other uh, issues. Now, but that's from them, from their uh, metabolomics point of view, from but uh, if you make it uh, to computer science, it's a classical big data uh, problem. Uh, why it's a big data problem? Because their process generates a lot of data, a lot. And every pixel in the image, they generate all kinds of uh, details from there. And then they scale those molecules from those images. So you have a huge number of data that at some point explodes from original medical image. And then they need to process it. Now, the... Biggest challenge here, and this is how it works for them. 
now it's uh, the your your it's the project metaspace and uh, you will hear uh, there is a link to to their project uh, uh, now so so it starts with some medical data sets that user uploads like one gigabyte one terabyte then user will choose some kind of molecular databases and then a uh, the metaspace uh, algorithms and all kinds of their proprietary logic starts to run and uh, analyze this medical data set. Eventually, at the end, when this process finished, there will be generated small images with regions from this huge image, and those images contain exactly where the anomalies were detected. Now, why this is very interesting uh, from the big data point of view, because uh, only in runtime, when you already started to run your workload, only then you need how much compute resources you need. So if you start, if you take this approach and run it over a cluster, you just create some cluster of machines, you run it over this cluster, only in runtime you will know if this cluster was too small or too big. Uh, because it's not enough to see if it's one gigabyte, I need so many machines. If it's one terabyte, I need another part, many machines. It's not that. It's the data that's been generated as part of the runtime. Uh, now, with LitOps, address this big data challenge because LitOps doesn't need to do anything in advance. If this part generates a request for more invocations, LitOps deploy more invocations. If it needs less invocations, you have less invocations, and then you pay exactly for what you need. Um, and this is an example. I'm going to show you this example again in YouTube because it doesn't run here well in the PowerPoint. Uh, now, I decided to, to keep this example uh, um, as is. And what, what I mean as is, I mean, it will run about 10 minutes. Uh, so uh, there are no school kind of tricks here how to make it faster, but 10 minutes, it's already very good uh, because it processes data sets and deploy a lot of workloads here. And again, from user point of view, he is not aware of this uh, complexity, how to move to the cloud, how to run it there. He, you only focus on the business logic, and the business logic here is that uh, algorithms from a, a from MBL that uh, does this uh, spatial metabolomics uh, detection, and here all the data is stored in object storage, public object storage, and now you start to run those workloads, and I'm going. Uh, you will not see much here. We'll see, we'll see different steps here. Let LitOps just execute them one by one. And if you see here different steps, need of decide on different number of resources it needs. And if you go here, here's the most interesting part. If you go at the end, you will see here the summary. Uh, what actually happened here in the background once they complete the job. Uh, and here I'm going to stop. Uh, so there were about 16 steps that were deployed. Uh, I just need to a bit here. Oh, yeah. So there were about six steps that were that LitOps used for them, uh, for this workload. And uh, this step used 256 invocations. This step used 32 invocations. This step used 350 invocations. It was two gigabyte memory, and so on. So every step, uh, LitOps will generate as as much invocations as my memory needed, and then you only pay for what you actually need. Now, if you use this uh, notebook and you use a uh, bigger data sets, then you will see here thousands of invocations and perhaps maybe more memory. So all this dynamic happens and, uh, and I and like it very much. Uh, as I said, it's a open source project by those guys and you can uh, you will see the link to them uh, after the talk. And now at the end of this process, you will see those images that are uh, 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 generated and printed, and this is exactly those images that. Uh, and by the way, this notebook on their, on their website, it's uh, self-defined. You can just get there to the metaspace and take this notebook and other notebooks and just run it uh, by yourself, and it's uh, very cool. Um, good. Another example that I can show you, but we already saw it's a sort of uh, Monte Carlo simulations. Uh, now, Monte Carlo simulations, again, it's not data driven as uh, here in this example, it's data driven. You have data sets in object storage, and it starts with it. 
Uh, Monte Carlo usually has less data in this, in this example. And, uh, and this example is how you can do stock prediction uh, with Litops. Uh, and again, if you will see it, uh, oops. If you will see it, it will be very similar to what you to what you saw before. And you have a, a you have a business code, you have your business logic. Now you want to run it, and here you want to run a many simulations. I mean, so Monte Carlo, this kind of simulations, you need to run many many predictions uh, to get some uh, results. Again, it's not about stock prediction; it's about the way how you can take uh, Monte Carlo simulations run with Litops. I mean, so it's not. Uh, I, I never saw someone who got. Uh, Reach because he ran this notebook, but it's very good example of how you can get uh, many compute, and uh, and again you can run the simulations uh, with the like uh, a five hundred forecast, and you want to run five invocations, you know you want to run five, very small calculations, and now let's me run it over my local machine. So I took here a very small number of simulations I want to run because I just want to demonstrate it to you. How it's run. So if I run it over my uh, local machine, I use five threads, uh, and you will see here that I'm going to get now a result. Again, it takes time, so even five invocation, because it's it's a bit uh, compute intensive. So in five invocation, it takes time to run it over your local laptop. And here, a very small forecast number we project. Uh, so you will see the results are very very. Uh, unclear. It takes uh, if you print them, you will see that it's, it's very unclear. It, it's it because it's not enough to run 500 forecast. But now let me just uh, do the trick. I can get and I want to run much more invocation. I want to run here uh, about one one uh, 150 concurrent invocations. You now it will be much more simulations, and uh, now I can take uh, I project much more forecast. And again, in this example, I'm using the uh, Kubernetes CPI in the backend. And now I'm going to use this uh, exact code and deploy it against the code engine, IBM Cloud code engine. And it's deployed there. This time it run much more invocations. And uh, I will get uh, very soon my results. Uh, and uh, yeah, as I said, Kubernetes CPI. And so there is 151 invocations in the cloud and they're compute intensive. And the results will be, let's take them. Yes, let's start getting. And uh, we will see how much time it takes. It takes I think it takes uh, somewhere between one and two minutes to deploy it. And you obviously can take, if you have enough resources in your account, you can obviously deploy it, not 150 invocations. You can deploy also 1,000 invocations if you want, or much more, and you will get more accurate results. Yeah, so we see it's completed in 103 seconds, that simulation. And if you see now histogram, you see it's much more correct values, and and this is where the the the, the power of this came when you can deploy your code uh, this massive scale. Um, I will stop here. I have another example, but I think uh, I made the point and I'm going back to the summary. Uh, and uh, uh, so we saw kind of examples. We saw that I, at least I hope I managed to explain there are some challenges how you move from your business logic from your existing application to serverless. Uh, but on the other hand, serverless, it's a great attractive platform. It's, if you run it on your hybrid, in your organization, public cloud, you make them together. It's a perfect uh, platform to run all kinds of workloads. Uh, so LitOps is a framework that's uh, designed to, bring, to, to fill this gap, how you get to the cloud, how to push to the cloud experience. So demos, use cases. If you go to the project page of the LitOps, you will see many presentations. You will see many resource papers that we published, uh, all kinds of other demos. And uh, it's an active project. You're welcome, of course, to contribute or comment or any other issues you want to ask. It just uh, it doesn't need to stop after after this talk. Just go to the project, and you can always find me there. And uh, 
and we have like 15 minutes for the questions so i'm uh, that's it awesome thank you so much gil and thank you for all of the um tutorials it was really cool to see that um it doesn't look like we have any questions right now, but I know you just ended your presentation. So folks, if you have a question for Gil while he's here, feel free to submit it through the chat. We'll uh, just give a few seconds here, or you can use the Q&A tab um, also in the platform. Just give folks a min few seconds here and <laughs> see if anyone has a question. Okay, well, I guess that means that you solved it all, Gil. <laughs> Perfect presentation no, today. <laughs> <laughs> um, just a quick note, folks, there, Gil's email here is uh, on the screen. It'll also be in the slides. So if you do have questions, we encourage you to reach out to him. Um, but yeah, that's going to do it for us today. Thank you all for attending. We look forward to seeing you at a future CNCF webinar. Have a great day and stay safe, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay,